Hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Extracellular Vesicles as Diagnostic and Therapeutic Tools for Cancer. I'm Alexis Cross of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Sarah Busato, PhD student in Technology for Health. Sarah is a PhD student in Professor Burgess's Colloidal Clinical Chemistry Laboratory at the University of Brescia in Italy. Currently, she's also a visiting pre-doctoral student in Professor Wolfram's Nanomedicine and Extracellular Vesicles Group at Mayo Clinic in Florida. In 2015, Sarah graduated from the University of Brescia in Italy with a master's degree in medical biotechnology. Her research focuses on exploring the targeting and drug delivery capacity of extracellular vesicles in vitro and in vivo. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Sarah, you may now begin your presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Busatto, and today I'm going to talk to you about extracellular vesicles and they foreseen applications as therapeutic tools for cancer. The data that I'm going to discuss were obtained during my PhD project, so the experiments were performed both at the University of Brescia in Italy and at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, United States. Let's start with a brief outline of my presentation. I will start introducing extracellular vesicles, then I will move to technology for use for extracellular vesicle isolation and characterization. Then I will talk about a robust method to determine those dependent uptake cures of extracellular vesicles by culture cells. Then I will talk about extracellular vesicles, uh, vesicles as a source of new liver cancer biomarkers and uh, as the extracellular vesicles as mm, supported lipid bilayer. Extracellular vesicles are an heterogeneous class of cell-secreted nanoparticles, and we can distinguish between microvesicles, also called exosomes, budded from the plasma membrane that has a size ranging from 100 to 1,000 nanometers, an exosome of endosomal origin with the size ranging from 30 to 150 nanometers. Extracellular vesicles are delimited by a liquid bilayer derived from cellular membrane and encased by active cargo, namely small genetic materials and peptides. Throughout the presentation, I will also refer to them with their acronym EVs. Extracellular vesicles transport and protect molecular information. So, um, and they transfer this information to target cells. So they are also able to modify the target cell metabolism and phenotype. Transferring their bioactive cargo, extracellular vesicles mediate intercellular communication and support both physiological and pathological processes. For example, accordingly to um, a growing number of studies, extracellular vesicles have the capability to um, initiate the premetastatic mimic formation and also to promote the atherosclerotic plaque destabilization. In the past years, 
due to the central role that they play in the cell communication, extracellular vesicles started to be envisioned as a valuable cell-free strategy for various biomedical applications. For example, um, we can use extracellular vesicles in diagnostics as source of new biomarkers or as a material to build a biosensor. Or also we can use extracellular vesicles in therapeutics for example, stem cells derived extracellular vesicles can be used in regenerative medicine, or uh, extracellular vesicles can be also used as drug delivery vehicles, or again, they can represent the target of therapy. Extracellular vesicles can be isolated from many different biological fluids. The biological fluids are uh, complex biological matrices composed by um, a plethora of other nano-sized biomaterial that can overlap in size and density extracellular vesicles. Therefore, we need to be really careful doing the extracellular vesicle isolation in order to not concentrate together with our EVs other nanoscale uh, molecules and objects that may act as contaminants in the final formulation. Of course, contaminants can change the overall physical chemical properties of the formulation and may affect the final biological sample activity. In fact, contaminants can exert a biological function in concomitance with extracellular vesicles, emphasizing or hiding extracellular vesicle function and causing also artifact and misleading results. The simplest matrix that we can use to um, separate extracellular vesicles is the cell culture medium. That is considered simple since we can control its composition. But we can also process more complex biological fluids, such as patient-derived samples that require much more attention. In order to separate extracellular vesicles, we can apply different protocols or isolation strategies according both to the sample volume, but also to the sample application. The widely used method uh, to process large volume of sample is, for example, ultracentrifugation. But if we need to process, let's say, smaller volume of sample, we can also use commercially available isolation kits based on polymer precipitation and, uh, for example, also gradient made of sucrose or eudixanol, or also size exclusion chromatography. The choice of the proper isolation method is not trivial, as shown by this following data. In this work, uh, we isolated extracellular vesicles starting from the same volume of the same sample, mainly one ml of serum, from patient affected by multiple myeloma. Extracellular vesicles were isolating using different techniques, um, serial centrifugation and ultracentrifugation, named as, as UC, polymer-based precipitation kit, named as KIT, sucrose and eudicinal gradient, named as SG and IG, respectively. As you can see, um, after the isolation, samples were analyzed by Western Blot Analysis to visualize typical AV markers. Interestingly, all the samples show characteristic AV biomarkers corroborating the presence of theoretically comparable and consistent AV population uh, in all the four different AV samples. But if we further evaluate the samples checking, for example, their microstructure through atomic force microscopy, we can see that the sample isolated through ultracentrifugation and or with the precipitation kit display a thick matrix that surrounds our extracellular vesicles. In contrast, the preparation from eudixanol and sucrose gradient do not present any trace of residual matrix. So um, we analyzed also if the, um, prepar the matrix present inside the preparation influence the preparation final biological activity. We specifically analyzed the NFKB nuclear translocation induced in endothelial cells after the exposure 
to extracellular vesicles isolated from serum of patient affected by multiple myeloma. Cells were incubated with the preparation isolated through UC and precipitation kit. And as you can see, they did not, did not show um, a significant NFKB nuclear signal. In contrast, the cells incubated with the pure EV preparation obtained from eudixonal and sucrose gradients show, uh, showed um, a strong NFKB nuclear translocation signal. The overall result demonstrated that the choice of the exosome isolation method uh, from biological fluids is of capital importance and that also the sample purity grades should be checked before um, doing further experiments with our extracellular vesicles. Other than uh, the previously cited isolation methods, there are, other, there are also other techniques that um, are now used to concentrate extracellular vesicles from um, biological fluids. For example, tangential flow filtration is a size-based technique used to concentrate extracellular vesicles. TFS couples permeable membrane filtration and tangential flow to obtain efficient concentration of extracellular vesicles from colloidal matrix. Tangential flow filtration is different from conventional dead end filtration because um, the fluid flows tangentially across the surface. So um, the flow avoids the filter cake formation. In this study, to evaluate TFS performances, we compare the TFS with the UC, ultracentrifugation, side by side, for processing a large volume of cell culture media. A D processed um, by the two methods, ultracentrifugation and tangential flow filtration, have comparable biophysical properties. For example, their size distribution is the same and ranges between 60 and 600 nanometers. The transmission electron microscopy showed with both methods nano-sized particles with a, spherical, with a spherical structure characteristic to that of extracellular vesicles. And both the sample analyzed with Western blots showed um, characteristic extracellular vesicle marker, such as CD63 and CD81, whereas Calnexin, an, endoplas an endoplasmic reticulum marker used as a control to detect intracellular vesicle contaminants, was undetectable. And this corroborates the sample purity, which is enriched just in extracellular vesicles. So uh, compared to ultracentrifugation, tangential flow filtration resulted in one to two orders of magnitude increase in extracellular vesicle recovery per million culture cells. And uh, accordingly, the yield of extracellular, oh, sorry. <laughs> the yield of extracellular vesicles from the same amount of media, 100 ml, was improved approximately five-fold with tangential flow filtration. Furthermore, the ability of both methods to separate contaminants with typical protein size was essayed by spiking the samples with known amounts of fluorescent albumin. The results revealed that TFS leads to a 40-fold improvement in the ability to remove albumin compared to ultracentrifugation. Furthermore, the albumin concentration differed substantially among the free sample processed by ultracentrifugation, highlighting a lack of fetch-to-batch consistency of this procedure. So once we are able to properly isolate and characterize the formulation of extracellular vesicles, we still need to determine our sample concentration. In fact, the titration of our sample is fundamental as demonstrated by this work, which proposes a robust method to accurately determine those dependent uptake curves of extracellular vesicles by cells. This method is based uh, on a consistent relative dosing of highly 
pure nano-sized extracellular vesicles and flow cytoplometric analysis. Specifically, uh, in this work, we isolated extracellular vesicles from the serum of healthy blood donors. After the isolation, we labeled the vesicles with a green fluorescent lipophilic probe. And then we incubated growing dosing of vesicles with different types of cancer cells, both human and mouse cancer cells. After three hours of incubation, cells were washed, collected, and analyzed by flow cytometry. The positive to fluorescent cells were the cells that perform a uptake. Interestingly, the data um, indicated that serum exosome isolated from healthy individuals are internalized by both mouse and human cancer cells displaying specific dose-dependent profiles. Furthermore, different cell lines displayed different uptake profiles. These differences may have several origins, ascribable both to um, cell or exosome phenotypes. In particular, at the intermediate dose of 2.5% to the 12 uh, exosome, each cell line showed a specific signature of uptake ratio. Whereas at the highest exosome dose, when saturating conditions arise, the internalization is involved a percentage of cells greater than 50% for all the cell lines. This specifically suggests that at the highest exosome concentration, the uptake is mainly determined by unspecific mechanisms due to the saturating conditions. This so reinforces that the, the rational that um, determination of cell line-specific dose-dependent uptake profile is a dereman starting point to significantly undertake more sophisticated targeting delivery experiments. A V-dose working range is a powerful analytical tool to set the optimal condition for further investigation and becomes a requirement for the correct setup and interpretation of any in vitro and in vivo results. So now that we uh, were able to properly isolate and characterize and dose our extracellular vesicle formulation, we can further study the extracellular vesicle composition. For example, in this study, we used RNA sequencing to perform um, a first comprehensive overview of the expression profile of coding and non-coding trans transcripts carried by extracellular vesicles secreted from four representative human liver cancer cell lines. Three of these liver cancer was, were, were hepatocarcinoma, and one was hepatoblastoma cells. The characterization of the RNA cargo encased in the extracellular vesicles secreted by these four liver cancer cell lines may bring to the identification of new diagnostic markers useful as liver cancer diagnostic or prognostic markers. We know indeed that liver cancer is one of the major causes of the can of cancer related death, and its early diagnosis can significantly improve the five year patient survival. The results highlighted a um, high heterogeneity across the small um, extracellular vesicle RNA content of the four cell lines. And specifically, if we look at the extracellular vesicle microRNA content, we can see that among the 10 most abundant microRNAs, which count at least 50% of the extracellular vesicle microRNA cargo, some microRNA were consistently present across all four AD populations and specifically microRNA 215C was the most expressed across all the samples. Interestingly, microRNA 21 was already found to be secreted through um, extracellular vesicles and overexpressed in serum and plasma samples of patients affected by liver cancer. This corroborates the hypothesis that this microRNA 
can represent a good circulating non-invasive diagnostic and prognostic liver cancer biomarker. HUH6 extracellular vesicle, which are hepatoblastoma extracellular vesicles, carried instead the most specific subset of microRNAs, missing or encasing low concentration of microRNAs, which were particularly abundant in the other extracellular vesicle samples, and carrying a unique subset of other microRNAs, such as the um, microRNAs 371, 372, and 373 cluster. This is a cluster that has been already specifically linked to um, human embryonic stem cells and is directly associated to embryonic carcinoma. Hepatoblastoma cell line, HUH6, is considered to be an embryonal tumor and overexpressed also MIRNA uh, microRNA 373 and microRNA 371. So the high abundance of these microRNAs cluster in extracellular vesicle released from hepatoblastoma cells conf confirm the hypothesis that these uh, microRNAs which had, had already been proposed as a blood-based biomarker for more aggressive tumors, may also uh, be good candidates as hepatoblastoma markers. This um, last example, instead, talk about um, another application of the extracellular vesicle. Specifically, in this case, we engineer our extracellular vesicle synthesizing the first uh, um, supported lipid bilayer made with extracellular vesicles. And I, um, I will call it with the acronym uh, FVSOB. The FVSOB um, patterns in two dimensions the key properties of extracellular vesicle membranes, which present intermediate, com intermediate complexity between synthetic mimics, such as liposome, and natural cell membranes, and have the innate link to phenotype and function of the originating cells. So for this reason, we investigate in the formation pathway and the properties of the VSLB, and we synthesize our VSLB starting from nano-sized extracellular vesicles purified from TRAMP-C2 cells, which are a prostatic cancer mirroring cell line used as a model for prostatic cancer. So extracellular vesicles were separated from cell culture media of TRAMP-C2 mirroring cells, and um, they were carefully characterized. TRANS-C2 extracellular vesicles displayed all the characteristic extracellular vesicle biomarkers and were free from um, intracellular nano-sized uh, contaminants. They were also uh, round-shaped and nano-sized. And we also investigated the topography of some of this protein inside the extracellular vesicle structure performing a dedicated dot plot assay with and without the detergent. The presence of the detergent um, is fundamental because it disrupts the AV membranes and probes both membrane and cargo proteins, whereas the assay um, performed without the detergent leaves the extracellular vesicle intact and uh, um, thus selectively probes the membrane proteins with outside-oriented epitopes. So with this dot plot result, we can see that two proteins, annexin-5 and CSAR, were exposed in the um, outer leaflet of our extracellular vesicle membrane, whereas AGO2 is encased uh, inside, the inside the extracellular vesicle structure. We further analyzed the AVSLB during its formation. In this ASM topography imaging, 
image, we can see the um, central part where the VSLB is already formed. And here on the side, we can see a still intact, intact extracellular vesicles. We, um, we then also wanted to um, get a first hint whether the VSLB also keeps in uh, two dimension the topology of the native three dimension AV membrane and get also further indication of on the um, AVSLB structure. So to do so, we investigated the accessibility in our AVSLB of the proto-oncogene tyrosine protein kinase as SRC, CSARC. This protein is involved in about 50% of tumors and they play also a key role in signaling endocytosis and exocytosis processes. Moreover, CSARC um, was found highly enriched in our extracellular vesicle formulation and its association, um, and it was specifically associated to the outer leaflets of our extracellular vesicle membrane. The VSLB and a control supported lipid bilayer made with synthetic liposomes made, named as POPC SLB were initially both labeled with red fluorescent lipophilic probe and then were immunoassayed with a green fluorescently labeled antibody against the CSARC. For the control POPC SLB, the green fluorescent signal of the second of the antibody is completely absent. This confirmed that no one specific interaction between the primary um, the, the antibody and the supported lipid bilayer is present. Contrary, in the VSLB, this show um, section with the patched regions where the green fluorescent signal is present and also overlays with the red signal of the lipophilic probe, confirming the co-localization of the red lipid probe and the green antibody. So this data indicates that the VSLB displays patch regions that preserve the original protein CSARC. So we can say that merging the overall results, um, we, can, um, we can say that we were able to um, synthesize and to analyze the structure of our extracellular vesicle made supported lipid bilayer. And that they are formed from, from nano-sized extracellular vesicles isolated from cell culture media, following a characteristic crowding fusion pathways. Furthermore, this supported lipid bilayer, even after their synthesis, still preserve proteins which are characteristic of the starting extracellular vesicle population. Conclusively, um, why we did that? We did an extracellular vesicle supported lipid bilayer because we think that this could be a tool for study the so far inaccessible properties of the extracellular vesicle membrane. And also because they could advance extracellular vesicle made assay, but also biosensors, and also because they can represent a novelty in biogenic surfaces and in surfaces biotechnology. In conclusion, with this brief seminar, um, I just wanted to introduce what extracellular vesicles are and give a um, first hint on their possible future applications. So taken together, we can say that cancer cell-derived extracellular vesicles have great potential for improving the diagnosis and treatment of cancer of tumor disease. Thank you so much for your attention. And now I am open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. 
Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, we can use different approaches in order to separate EVs from their matrix. Are they always invasive towards sample properties? So hello, everyone. Uh, yes, um, as I said during the presentation, we can use many kind of different isolation approaches. And uh, some of them are well known to affect uh, specifically uh, the structure and therefore also uh, the properties, uh, such as, for example, ultracentrifugation. Uh, sometimes if ultracentrifugation has a poor yield also because during the sample processing we damage and so lost um, a lot of our extracellular vesicles. So I would prefer new uh, generation uh, isolation techniques to isolate extracellular vesicles such as the tangential flow filtration that I cited in my presentation, but there are also many other approaches, uh, also um, HPLC, that works in control range of pressures, and so they are more delicate and gentle um, with, the, with the biological samples. Now, our next question, Sarah. Can I know TFS cutoff range for, exome, uh, for exosomes enrichment? Yes, sure. So in this case, we use um, two uh, cutoffs because we did two filtration steps. In the first filtration step, we use a cutoff that eliminated all the particles with a size above 600 nanometers. And um, in the second step, we eliminated all the particles with a size below 30 to 40 nanometers. So we kept the population that surely goes between 50 nanometers and 600 nanometers. Why do you, uh, why do you not analyze exosomes directly instead of interactions with them with the cells and then analyze? Well, thank you for this question because it's really clever. So in two words, resolution issue because when we want to visualize a particle, a fluorescent particle with a size below 200 nanometers, um, the resolution that we need must be really high, really powerful. So in this case, we wanted to use instead two methods such as um, quantification methods and also detection flow cytometry that are really commonly used in all the, um, the laboratories. For that reason, um, we wanted to uh, study the, pure, the positive to fluorescent cells that allowed us to get a higher resolution instead of the exosome because they are not visible in classical flow cytometry. So, Sarah, are cell cultures good EV sources for the massive production or purification of EVs? Actually, I think that they are a good, um, a good starting point. I mean, um, they are a simple biological system, of course. We can, um, we can move them to... Uh, 2D organoids and so on, but let's talk about just the simple cell culture is um, a good starting point because it allows to get high volume of um, biological fluids from um, where we can get our extracellular vesicles. And also there are um, new works now that are, that are using specifically um, much um, complicated uh, systems such as continuous bioreactor-based cultures that can uh, even more um, get closer to what are real condition of extracellular vesicle secretion. So I think that they are a good starting point, as I said. Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting so many good questions in today, so please keep them coming in. As a reminder, any questions we don't have time for today will be answered by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of the registration. So let's keep going with them. 
Did you investigate differing culture conditions, for example, cell confluence, media composition, supplementation, 2D versus 3D cultures, on EV production or cargo content? This is a really interesting question. So, um, yes, we investigated um, at least the productivity uh, of the cells um, in different condition and how it varied the extracellular vesicle secretion. And I can say that um, cells, seeded cells um, that are 100% confluent do not produce a lot of vesicles as if they are, let's say, 60 to 80% confluent because so in, in that case, they need to communicate between each other, so they secrete the vesicles. Other than that, I know that starvation um, of the cells um, may vary the extracellular vesicle composition because we introduce a stressor. And also the percentage of, um, of oxygen and, uh, that, that we use during the, the cell culturing. Yes, these uh, are um, meaningful variable of our experiments. I never investigated and said um, 2D and 3, the difference between 2D and 3D cultures, but this is a really interesting point. Thank you. So our next question is a two-part question. Could you please talk a little, um, excuse me, could you please talk a little about imaging of extracellular vesicles and what is considered state-of-the-art for imaging of isolated vesicles? I'm sorry, I, I had a really bad service. Can you, can you repeat, please, um, the question? Of course. It's um, just so you can see it's question number 12, and it's a two-part question. Could you please talk okay, a little okay. about imaging of extracellular vesicles and what is considered state-of-the-art for imaging of isolated vesicles? So as I said before, um, they are nano-sized, so they are a little bit tricky to image. Um, in my uh, laboratory experience, I use mainly um, AFM, atomic force microscopy, and also uh, TEM, so electron microscopy, and specifically cryo-TEM work really, really well. And they, have, they are both with the resolution um, that is um, okay to image extracellular vesicles. Uh, you can also use two photon microscope and also confocal microscope. They are, they are good too. And um, the, the other part, um, the, the one about the isolation technique, right? I, um, yes what is considered state-of-the-art for imaging of isolated vesicles. I'm sorry, I, 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 really, I really had a bad service. The, the question number 13 you said? Uh, 12, number 12. 12, no, I, I, okay. What is considered state-of-the-art for imaging? Okay, um, again, AFM and uh, electron microscopy both uh, TM and cryo TM mainly, yes, I would say that. So, Sarah, our next question. Is there any difference yeah. between the exosome isolation technique used with adherent cells compared with suspension cells? Um, for, to my knowledge, I would say no. Uh, the only thing that you wanted to be sh that you want to be sure is that you um, eliminate all the cell and cell debris. But either if you use a differential centrifugation steps or if you use um, size-based isolation methods and so on, uh, all these um, isolation approaches. Um, allowed you to discard first cells, dead cells, and cell debris, and then uh, proceed to extracellular vesicle isolation. So, no, there are no differences to my knowledge, at least. So, our next question is, again, a two-part question. 
Do you find that okay. your cell culture process affects EV yield? And the next part is, does your cell culture preparation need special media, supplements, or any other form of optimization to grow cells that will give you a high yield of EVs? So um, as said before, yes, something is really, um, some parameters during cell culture are, are really important to, um, to have uh, also a good yield do, during your harvesting. For example, the cell confluence and um, the, the, cell, uh, the cell media may vary accordingly to the culture cells, of course. Another suggestion that I have is to use um, uh, special uh, commercially available uh, SPS, uh, fetal bovine serum, as a supplement, or um, th that is specifically depleted of um, endogenous uh, extracellular vesicles. So um, you won't have them as contaminants of your preparation because, of course, they won't exert their own uh, biological activity, and you don't want that. And um, yeah, these two are the, the main comments. Now, cell culture conditions partially mimic the body condition but do not reproduce the same environment. Do cultured cells produce the same vesicles as the cells in their native environment, as in like a tissue or organ? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, the, the conditions are really, really different. We can mimic just few parameters and not all the um, organ or tissue environment, so they are different. But even if they are different, they can still represent the um, uh, originating tissue, and uh, everything um, is depends on the application that we envision for our the cellular preparation and extracellular vesicle-based experiments. So um, the, the, simple, uh, the, the, the simple answer is no, but we can still use um, extracellular vesicle derived from cell culture as a good mimic. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Are intracellular payloads specifically incorporated into EV and with which mechanisms? So um, apparently, both um, membrane components such as protein and extracellular vesicle payloads such as uh, microRNAs or generally non-coding RNAs are um, specifically loaded into the vesicles. Um, this is mainly because um, vesicles do not contain all the RNAs and all the proteins, um, or uh, um, they do not have an heterogeneous representation of all the proteins and all the RNA content in the secreting cells, but they just encase and represent a, a meaningful selection of the proteins and the RNAs that, that we can find in the secreting cells. And specifically, for example, in the work talking about um, uh, liver cancer cells, uh, microRNA content and non-coding RNA content, we found that comparing the uh, microRNAs that we found them rich in the cells and that the one that we found them rich in the extracellular vesicles, some of them were not detectable in the cells, but only in the extracellular vesicles. And that for us means that uh, there is a um, specific selection of some microRNAs that are directly loaded and secreted um, through extracellular vesicle mechanism. Thank you, Sarah. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, well, I would like to thank everybody. Thank you for attending this webinar. I hope that you, um, you found it useful and interesting. It was a pleasure for me to be part of this amazing project, and I would like to thank you all again. Thank you again, Sarah, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labrix and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. 
Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through May of 2019. Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.